I wanted to make this video for two reasons. The first one, much like my first video, I just wanted to make it because some people seem not to have understood the movie. By some people, I mostly mean critics, because when I was reading reviews and whatnot of Closet Learned, I found that a lot of the critics, they just altogether skipped some of the major points of the story and chose instead to focus on some aspects that are only as relevant as the main aspects of the story. But on the most part, from what I've seen on YouTube and whatnot, fans of the movie and even general audiences seem to have understood the movie pretty well. So the second reason is mostly for my own personal enjoyment because I just want to explain the movie because I like it so much. So I want to say that the aspect that bothered me the most when I was reading those articles by critics and whatnot is the fact that everyone decided to focus on the government oppression aspect of the story instead of the victim of sexual abuse aspect of the story. And that is the main point of the story, really. And some articles, some reviews, some critics did not make mention of it at all. And you could argue that they just didn't want to spoil you, but no, they would discuss, they would mention the government aspects of the story, but they would completely forego the rest. And that makes no sense. If you're going to analyze this movie properly, well, you can't just forget about the whole victim of abuse aspect of it. So I think that the anti-oppression messages, they are here, but they are only as relevant as the main point of the story. And the goal of the movie is to be a platform to heal from trauma. The character labeled the victim undergoes a process throughout the entire movie that is meant for her to heal from her childhood trauma, which is first and foremost the point of the film. The anti-oppression messages are only as relevant as that. So how does it all work? How is the main aspect of the movie a healing process? How is this movie depicting a healing process? So to recognize and understand it, you need to understand how fiction and healing works in general. Fiction works just like imagination. Imagination relies on the mind's powerful ability of make-believe, which means that when you imagine something, you can pretend that it is real while maintaining a healthy level of distance and also not truly living and experiencing the content that you're imagining. And fiction is an extension of that. By using your creative abilities and your imagination and by pouring the content of your mind into it, you can create a story that will feel real without it being real. This process can be useful because one of the ways that you can use it is that you can return to events that have happened in your life by simulating them while remaining at a distance from them. You can create something that mirrors events in your life without actually relieving them and thus sparing yourself the psychological harm that could potentially come from it. By relieving these events in such a setting, you're able to use the level of distance that it provides to freely observe a situation and recreate it and analyze it in ways that you are not necessarily afforded when you're just in the midst of a moment. And in the case of the character of the victim in Close and Learn, it would be during a traumatic moment. And that process is useful because you can only ever heal from anything, from any problem whatsoever, you know, depending on the degree of suffering that comes with it only by returning to it and confronting it. And, and that way you are able to get to the center of the issue, the emotion not inside of you, if you will, that was caused by either trauma or generally negative moments in your life. And undo that knot in an environment that you can control, quotation marks for this movie, and step away from whenever needed. Because your mind pours your either trauma or whatever it is that you need to heal from, into the setting, into the story, you can build a process inside of it that aims to heal the trauma, or the whatever you need to heal from, and provide the catharsis. In the case of Closet Land, you have a movie titled after the fantasy land created by the character of the victim in during traumatic moments. The director put this character in an environment that purposefully mirrored her childhood abuse and her childhood trauma. And you can see that all of the conditions that she's in are meant to replicate what she has been through in the past. 
And it's precisely because she's in this situation that she can explore those issues, she can explore the issues that the setting is revealing and bring it back to the surface, and she can get to the bottom of them, she can fix the consequences that stem from them in the first place, and heal and move on from them. So how is the victim, well, a victim? So from the get-go, it really should be obvious to the viewer that she is, in fact, a victim of a... So the very first scene is meant to mirror the wound that the character is carrying. So she is presumably in a room, but she can't see anything because everything is dark and all she can hear is a voice and footsteps. Those particular conditions are a trigger for her because they remind her of the closet she had been locked in as a child and of what she went through while in there. The fact that the whole interrogation aspect slash setting of the story happens to mirror those negative moments that she has lived through isn't a coincidence. It's done on purpose and precisely so because the movie is meant to be a healing process. And that particular trigger is at the center of the movie, it's the core of the story. That's why the film is titled after it. The fact that those conditions resemble the conditions that she had in the closet is something you can understand only later, but even then, she doesn't really need to spell it out for you, for the viewer, to understand that she is a victim of some kind of abuse. Her behavior is very revealing, because first, she immediately complies with the nearest authority and instantly tries to bargain with them without at any moment stepping over the line. And even though she's in obvious distress, you know, both physically and mentally, her first response is to stifle that in order not to make waves because that way, if she does not make any waves, she is not going to upset or otherwise anger the person who is in authority and who has the power over her and who might hurt her as a consequence. So this is, without a doubt, a mechanism that she has picked up from her first past abuser, whether you believe that this abuser is the interrogator here or not. This is something that she has picked up in the past and her subconscious first and immediate response is just to regurgitate that in a time of stress. And the second thing that also not only proves that she is a victim of abuse, but also plays again on her past trauma and mirrors what she has been through in the past, is the interrogator's behavior. He purposefully distorts her sense of reality, he forces her to feel as if she's no longer grounded, there's also a lot of victim blaming going on around, and he's also guilt tripping her by shifting the blame from himself to her. Then he creates a power imbalance by placing himself as the authority of the situation and removing the power from her hands. And all those behaviors continue during the entire movie. I'll explain why they are happening later. So this behavior is the typical sort of behavior that she had been exposed to, that has been ingrained in her in her past. So there's this little scene where he seemingly gives her a window to escape and you might be wondering why did she actually stay? So the main reason I think is that the interrogator has been taunting her the entire time and that is confusing the hell out of her. You know, he keeps just playing bad cop, good cop with her and she thinks that if she just complies with him, nothing bad is going to happen because the more you obey, since obedience is what is expected of you, the better things go for you in the sense that it possibly minimizes losses on your end. So of course that's not really the case, but that's the behavior you are encouraged to have. Second, and it's a little bit more subtle, but this is the main reason also I think, is that subconsciously the character is driven by the impulse to fix her life. So as I've explained, this whole movie is a platform to heal from trauma and deep down inside she is not necessarily confronting this wound inside of her because on a daily basis she wouldn't be able to function and also because it's excruciatingly painful but in order like I said to actually heal and move on from it for good she has got to return to it and actually confront it and because this setting is giving her that opportunity she is drawn to actually stay. She's probably only semi-aware of it, and I think it's not fully obvious from the get-go. So I think that both reasons go hand in hand. It's both that she's confused and she's not certain of what to do next, but also that she can subconsciously sense that if she stays, it might actually change things for her. 
So now that we've established all that, let's explain some of the torture scenes in the movie, which is really the whole point of the story again. So I've mentioned before this that the point of this healing process and the point of exposing herself to something that mirrored that abuse is that A, she's not actually suffering from that abuse, but because she is in a setting that mirrors it, it's going to regurgitate all of her defense mechanisms against it. This is something that I will go into later on, but because she was a child, it goes without saying that she was powerless to stop anything. And that is what the torture scenes are meant to remedy. So the torture scenes in Close and Land are meant to give the character of the victim strength. Now this is why a lot of the scenes in this movie are aggressive or essentially contain some elements of torture. It's because certain processes that may at first initially not seem beneficial are actually beneficial down the line. So essentially here's how I work. Really basic example. When you are working out and you're lifting weights, you're essentially wrestling with gravity to increase your strength, your physical strength. If you falter when it becomes painful, when it becomes difficult, you never develop that muscle mass. And it's essentially the same way here. It's the difficulties of adversity and it's her not hiding from that and not avoiding it. It's her resisting it and facing it head on that allows her to build mental endurance and fortify herself psychologically. I think this is essentially the equivalent of turning pain into fuel, transforming pain into strength. This time, instead of going away in her mind, she decides to remain firmly grounded in reality and she decides to oppose what she is going through and she decides to oppose what is being done to her. One of the ways that this character has had to escape the traumatic events that have happened in her life is to escape in the fantasy land that she called Closet Land, where there were a whole bunch of, you know, magical creatures, etc, etc. She did not and could not make a stand for herself because she did not have the strength for it, because she was far too young for that. And this time, it's by facing all of this head-on, it's by facing the pain that is being applied on her, it's by not running away from it, as I said, that she can build strength. And that is precisely what happens in the story. At some point, there are a few scenes where she's being tortured physically. And she recites this mantra to herself that is meant to keep her will strong. Pain will only strengthen my will. You can break my body, but you cannot break my mind. Torture is the policy of tyrants. Resistance is my only weapon. You can break my body, but you cannot break my mind. Pain will only strengthen my will. By resisting this, by resisting the torture, by not simply laying down and die and taking it, she thus strengthened her resolve. And it provides her with, it gives her the strength that she liked when she was a child. The second aspect of the story that is meant to push her towards healing is, again, the interrogator's behavior. We've already mentioned that his behavior was mimicking her abuses. It's meant to provoke a reaction out of her. In the past, as a child, she had been taught to essentially submit to this kind of behavior. If someone was being toxic to her and manipulating her, she had been taught not to rebel against it. One of the incentives not to rebel against it is that, again, if she just simply obeys, it will minimize losses on her end. But now, this platform that resembles the negative events of her life throws that right back in her face in order to obtain the opposite reaction. Which, again, is exactly what happens. During that process, she gradually shifts from using all those ingrained victim behaviors that she has been taught and into a person who resists and defy what is being thrown her way. And it's actually a positive lesson to learn because that way, if anyone ever approaches her with this sort of toxic behavior again, she will know to her first identify it clearly and consciously and she will know how to deal with it and defend herself against it properly. Now, the third part of the healing process is the interrogator validating her. So if we look at it from the perspective of the government oppression it's actually pretty ironic that this man who is here to question her and is essentially torturing her to extract a false confession out of her is essentially praising her and telling her how impressive the power of her mind is. I wonder if you know 
really know the strength of your mind. Most people break down in a matter of hours. You've escaped from us on the back of a flying car. So that scene is crucial to the character's development and to her healing process. After hours of torture, she finally confesses. She reveals what she has been through in a closet. And it's an extremely delicate moment because she is finally at the point where she is consciously revealing and facing her trauma. And being validated at this very moment was pivotal for her to properly finish this process. And it's both validated validation from someone, anyone, and also validation from someone who resembles her abuser. It's this intricate bond where the person who has hurt you and applied suffering on you also coincidentally realizes is sensitive enough and discerning enough to realize and acknowledge how you have reacted to it and takes note of the incredible power of your mind. Oh, and by the way, the process that she mentally uses to escape from situations that are stress-inducing is called dissociation. To me, it almost resembles this sort of fantasy that you may have in your mind of someone who has hurt you or is hurting you, of recognizing your feelings and acknowledging them as a way to a, get the gratification and approval that you need and deserve. And B, also imagine and receive a positive experience with that person. And really this is why I say that this movie is primarily about a healing process, is primarily about healing from trauma. Because despite all the government oppression aspects of it, when it comes down to it, when we get to the bottom of things, when we get to the core of the story, what we see is a person who is facing their past hurt. We must go to closet. And so, at last, the healing process continues. This time, the interrogator is mimicking her abuse more directly. And again, it supports what I've been saying, because everything that happens from this scene on is no longer questioning, meant for her to sign that document. It's all meant for her to finish her healing process. This is the direction that the movie is taking. It seems to be the same thing, really, shutting it a child in a closet and shutting the people away if you can frighten a child into silence you can frighten the people too and with time they'll shut their eyes and not scream i never screamed in the closet did i and the people won't scream either they go around everything is fine everything's all right while their neighbors disappear all around them and then they will become like children Scared of bad men that chop a little chop off their heads. That's what's so terrifying because children are so powerless. They make such easy victims. The ending scene is the final part of the killing process and it's the only scene that I think is both about the abuse and also about government oppression. So my interpretation of the scene is this. The reactions that the character of the victim has had to her abuse, namely her compliance and lack of resistance, is something that has characterized her and shaped her as a person and influenced her actions the rest of her life until this moment. Just like she says, I never screamed in the closet, did I? The point is that because she had been silenced as a child, 
she remained silent for the rest of her life. It was something that she had been taught during her formative years, during her childhood. And so because of it, it removed the power from her, it removed the strength from her. And she never had the strength or the courage to speak out against governmental abuse of power. As she says, when her neighbor was abducted, she shut her eyes just like she did when she was in the closet. Which is why this scene is the final step of the healing process. By having unlearned all those behaviors during that process, during the process that happened all throughout the movie, and by having found her resolve and growing into herself, it's given her the power to say no, essentially, as cliche as that may sound. It's given her the power, the ability, the strength to tear that document apart and refuse to bend. She is breaking out of this flow and refuses to just go with it anymore. And it's that decision that finalizes the healing process. So at the end, whether or not she dies, she's arrested, she's brought at the back of the building to be shot at long range, whatever, none of this really matters. What really matters is that she has finished her development as a person. She has arrived at the finish line, at the ending of the process that this whole movie was about. What is important is the realization that she had been closing her eyes all her life, that she had been turning a blind eye to what was happening around her because of what happened to her in her past. And it's the decision to move on from this that is important in this moment.